Hello and welcome to Fire in the Belly. Today we have myself, Mighty Pete, and we're joined by Kyle McDowell. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Pete. How are you doing? Brilliant, brilliant. Listen, Mighty, and thanks for having you know, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate that. And so tell us, Kyle, who are you? What are you doing? Where are you from? Great. Yeah, well, listen, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. It means a lot and excited to spend the next next wee while with you. So my name's Kyle, Kyle McDowell, and I am I'm living in Belfast. Uh, but I am from a wee small town outside of Belfast called Carrick Fergus. So I still tell people that's where I'm from, even though I've just recently relocated to the city, very recently. And what I do is I am a, I'm a coach. I'm a, a, what people would know as probably a life coach, although I don't like to really call it that. I'm a positive psychology coach, which, um, you know, get, it, get into what that is and stuff, but it is... In a nutshell, using the principles of positive psychology through your coaching. And that's it in a nutshell. Wow. And is this a, a relatively recent development for you or is it, is it sort of built up? The, the positive psychology coaching has been something that I have been working towards now, probably I would say for the last couple of years. And positive psychology was a, a field that I get introduced to by one of my tutors in university. I went back a few years to do a psychology degree at Queen's, Queen's University. And I think it was in first year, so you're going back about four years ago. I got quite close with one of my tutors. And uh, through talking, he kind of realized that, that positive psychology would be a good field for me to get into. And I'd never heard of it before. And he said to me, you should check out this guy. He's called Martin Seligman. He, he is often referred to as like this, the godfather of positive psychology. And um, that was really it. The journey began then at the beginning of my psychology degree. And I always knew that I've always been helping people in past jobs and stuff like that. We can touch on that. But I knew that as I moved forward, moving into a coaching role and as a mentoring role, more full time, that positive, the positive psychology would be the, the background in which I wanted to be able to lay the foundations for my coaching. So yeah, probably over the last three, four years and really immersed myself in the positive psychology literature, probably within the last, since then, I would say, at least the last three, four years. So I'm still immersing myself in it daily. It's like a lifetime, lifetime ahead of you of constant journey, I take it? 100%, 100% it is. Yeah, I'm actually due to start my master's in, in September here in applied positive psychology. Wow. So that will be the, that's the next step. Uh, up the ladder it's the next goal state the bleeding obvious here but are you mr positivity people people would say yes most people would say yes uh i actually get it quite a lot where people will, will say you're the most positive guy that i've ever come across and how you always so positive and how you always so happy and and i've had actually a few times pete in in the last few maybe I went I went live last night for example on Instagram and, and I said something very similar where I'm so glad that that's the way I come across but of course I am absolutely not all those things all the time I'm, I'm a human being and my emotions and me as as a human being I it's impossible to be happy all the time it's impossible to be positive all the time so but I, I am grateful that for the most part that is that is what, what people would. I'd rather people see me as Mr. Positivity than the opposite, which is yeah. Mr. Negativity. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, think, I mean, listen, I think when you're more real too, I think people can resonate with that more than, you know, if you're constantly buzzing around, like, you know, Mr. Positivity, no matter what, you're kind of going, yeah, whatever, I can't, you know, it's like you're actually annoying me. Yeah. Whereas someone goes, listen, good days, bad days, highs, lows, you know, we all get it and we all got to yeah. constantly work on it. You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. more realistic. Yeah, that's cool. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So take us back. I mean, what what does fire in the belly mean to you? Well, yeah, it, when I was thinking about this question, for me, it, it's very much at the core. I I think about what what is it that that drives you at your core, right? So, in other words, what is your reason for being, right? So, if you can find your reason for being, that's going to give you that fire in the belly to get up every single day. And you can see it with people who, who love what they do, love the job that they do, love their life. You would say, oh, I wish, I wish, if using, using the, 
the title of the podcast, they have, they have a real fire in their belly. They have this real get up and go about them. And so when I think of that fire in, fire in the belly, it is that reason that, that you get up every day and you do what you do with a smile and, and it fulfills you. And you, probably a little bit deeper, you're aligning with, you're probably, your, what I would say is you're aligning, aligning your purpose with your passion, which is a big thing, which is a prop. That's probably it. Yeah, a, a fire in the belly is when you have aligned your purpose and your passion together and, and you know. Just for anyone that's not used to the language, talk to us a little bit about aligning. Or aligning. aligning. So, yeah, so what that really means is, is bringing the two on the same level. And so if I give an example of just what that would mean of, of aligning, say, your, your passion and your purpose. Um, so many people go through life where they are, they are not on the same level. And so their passion may well be to, their passion may well be to help other people, right? But they haven't quite realized yet that that's the, the calling on their life. And so what they're doing is, is they're, what, they, they might be working in a job which really isn't helping other people in the way that they want. So their purpose is, is, hasn't been aligned with that passion yet, or vice versa. Uh, people might have realized that their, their passion or their purpose and their calling is to serve and help others. That's their purpose. Uh, but what they're doing in their life isn't fulfilling them. So again, equal, it can be a job that isn't, isn't serving other people to the way that they want. And so when you bring the two in the same level and you start acting and living consistently, that's just, I mean, passion and purpose is, is one example. There's loads that you can talk about having on the same level. But when you have them two operating in the same frequency, then then that fire in the belly is going to, is going to be present. Hopefully that's, uh, that's probably the best way that we're trying to describe alignment for people, as you say, who aren't too familiar with the, the lingo. Yeah. No, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And would you say, does that tie into values and things like that? You know, people's yeah. beliefs and values. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and so one of the key things that I am all about is knowing who you are at your core and, a question I'll often ask people and clients alike and friends, whatever, is, you know, to answer the question, who am I? And quite often the, the, the responses will be, I am a parent or I am a brother or I am a business owner. And I've yet to meet really one person who goes beneath the surface and says, you know, I am a man of integrity. I am called to serve others. Uh, because a lot of people will start by saying there their name, I am Kai. And I usually say, right, well, listen, your name can be changed in five minutes in Deadpool. So you're not Kyle anymore. Who are you? And the idea behind that, uh, Pete, is to bring in what you had said. It's to understand your values, to understand a lot of even what we do in positive psychology is understanding your strengths, um, identifying your passions and your talents, and then encouraging you to live consistent with those so uh, let's take values for example living consistent with your values and that can go back into exactly what you said there about the passion and the purpose so if you really value so you say you value spending time with your family family time is something that you value quite highly but your work life actually contradicts that and doesn't allow it you are you're you're Again, you're not aligned, it's inconsistent. And so unhappiness will ensue because you're not living according to what your values are. And the, the beautiful thing about values is, is that they're totally subjective and that, that each and every uh, individual's values are different. And I often, I often try to highlight to people as well, values can also be good and bad. So the example I'll always give is, look, a gang of thieves can share values, right? <laughs> but it's not necessarily the sort of values you want to be living alongside. So yeah, to answer your question, values is something that when you know what they are, and, you, and what I say to people is when you know who you are at your core, I find it calling, or I uh, call it finding your lighthouse, right? 
And so the reason why I love that we analogy is because that when you think about what a lighthouse is, it just stands there in everything, right? In, in any environment, any circumstance, it doesn't matter whether it's rain, hail, snow, or the opposite. It could be a beautiful day, calm, clear, day, night. It stands, and more importantly, as I say to people, it's light still shines. And, and so to probably tie that question together, what I would say is, is that knowing your values, knowing who you are at your core, and I say this quite a lot, allows you to remain changeless in an ever-changing environment. Where our, our, our environment is always changing. We always find ourselves in situations that are different. And so when you know who you are at your core, it allows you to remain the same and, and, and be the same and eat, like a lighthouse. Mm. So you know who you are. You're not influenced by your, by your environment. That's great. So I mean, you, you have a theme or a brand as such, you know, that's the way you operate, but you have mm-hmm. stuff around you can change people's ideas of you can change. The environment can change. But as yeah. you say, that's the way you do what you do. Mm-hmm. Do you live by a mantra? Do you have a, a theme that you live to? Well, I would have I would have my own what I call personal philosophy, which is something that has taken me definitely t- took me a while to to work out what that personal philosophy was. So I suppose the answer is yes, and you know again not not something that happened overnight, and the, the philosophy is is that way of life that I try to live by. I can expand on it a little bit if you like. Please, yeah. Yeah, so again, my personal philosophy is, and this is just, this is just for me, and, and it's something that I try to do with all my clients, which is that's trying to identify your own personal philosophy. And um, again, nine times out of 10, when I start working with people, I'll say to them, tell me a little bit about your own personal mission statement and the, and the look at you. And they don't have a clue what you mean. And that's okay. You know, it's, it's, it's actually quite a cool icebreaker because they're like, all oh, right, I don't really know where we're going. And, um, and of course, the idea is that, look, if you go into a, a business, they, they have a mission statement and they want you to act in, uh, in accordance with that mission statement. They want you to, they'll have values and they'll try and employ people who align with those values. And so if it's the same for business, why can it not be the same for us? have our own mission statement and our own philosophy and so look the philosophy for me is is things like value so i've identified core for me is probably integrity and integrity i see as a, as a core principle and something that again allows you to integrity is something that absolutely allows you to know who you are in every environment and and it's hard it's very easy to say listen that's you should never compromise your integrity but of course, listen, um, there are environments and circumstances that we will always find ourselves in where our philosophy for life and our belief and what we say will always be tested. And so integrity is, is at the core of my philosophy, um, service to others. And one thing I've probably learned as well is probably how to serve myself also. Um, and it was, I can't actually remember who it was. Um, a week, quite a while ago, actually, I can't remember. And I was speaking about serving others and serving others. And the person said to me, how do you serve yourself? What do you do to serve you? And I was like, wow, that's great. That's really good. Because I had been pouring in so much into other people and wanting to serve other people that I realized that I wasn't really pouring into my own cup. Something that I now tell people to do quite a lot is that you cannot pour from an empty cup. And I was actually listening to a podcast this morning, which Again, the universe is just bringing all this. And it was, it was actually Tony Robbins and he was joking and something I've used for a while anyway, even before I heard it today, which is when you are on a plane and we're given the safety demonstration, the first thing to say is in an emergency, put the oxygen mask on your children first. And and everyone goes quiet and say, no, that's not what they say. They say, put it on yourself first because if you can't look after yourself, who's going to look after everybody else? And so service fundamentally to others, but recognizing also that it's important to serve and, and feedback into myself. Um, gratitude is fundamental in my philosophy for life. Um, and yeah, and so that, that's just a basic overview of it. Integrity, service, gratitude, and trying, trying my best every day to live in accordance with that 
philosophy or personal mission statement? I'm curious. You you've switched the the different words you brought up here, and I'm uh, sorry. I will get into the interview properly in a minute. But yeah. <laughs> so you've used principle, values, philosophy, mission. Mm-hmm. Yep. First of all, give us your your definition of the difference between a principle and a value, because you mentioned there sort of integrity being a core value as a as, sorry a core principle as opposed to a core value. Yeah. Yes. Is it is it the same or is it just is it more specific? I, I personally think it's slightly more specific and the reason why is is because your values can change. Right? And so your your value you can you can always be updating your values. I mean you can have certain values think think about how your, your life changes from when you're maybe twenty one to thirty one. So you'd like to think that if in those 10 years, say you've been lucky enough to maybe settle down, get married, have a family. When you were 21, if you didn't have all that, would you really value the importance of providing for your family or your kids? They're probably not going to be there because you you don't need to do it. So your values and your values can be context specific as well. So you could go into work and again, your work values are totally different to what your home values are because that's the values that work want you to bring however integrity can be present throughout all of those circumstances you can still show integrity in work the same way you're going to show integrity in the house the same way you're going to show integrity with your friends and so that's for me where i kind of make the distinction but they're very they overlap i mean it's very to be honest with you pete when i first started studying all this it took me quite a while to get my head uh, around the difference between the two because i was like surely they're the same and you know, you'll, you can use a lot of words where you'll say in, integrity is both a value and a principle. And that's, that's cool. That's, that's great. But for me, go ahead. I was going to say, can with a principle, could you say, I'm just trying to liken it into my language, I suppose, would it be the likes of, say, a, you know, a good work ethic? So an ethic being something, a principle that goes through you regardless of your job and what's going on? Or have I just brought in a completely different word again? No, no, no. Yeah, it's something that it's something that is going to be consistent. So... Again, a work ethic, I suppose you could apply that to the home as well. I was going to say, you know, you can have a good work ethic in the house and getting things done and helping out and making sure that all the, what needs done, needs done. Um, And so, you know, I would say that if you have a poor work ethic in the house and a good work ethic in the, in work, it's more your values you're talking about then. You kind of value that effort. You kind of value that uh, working harder a little bit more in work than you do in the house. Whereas if you have, let's say, work ethic as a core principle, core principles are things that just cannot cannot be argued against. So things like integrity, um, and so yeah, again, it could be. Yep, yeah. again, mate. I, what I want to say is, is that I'll go back to what I said there when I first started talking about it. The this is all my subjective take on it, and and a lot about what I've just learned and studied. But definitely, the the, the work ethic thing is something that you would like to think would be core and, and ever changing no matter where you are, but it might. Hmm. No, it's, it makes sense. I mean, it, in terms of, sort of if you're trying to almost stack blocks, if you like, you know, core principles are the fundamental, they're the, they're the base building That's blocks, it. right? That's it. Your values are coming on, on top of that then. Mm-hmm. Really, I suppose then, I don't know what's above that. You're, you're kind of in the stage of whether it be your, well, your mission, where does your mission come in? Is it above your values or is it, is it, one and the same it depends what you mean by mission okay fair enough I suppose well it whether it be your life mission i'll put it in that context then yeah well your life mission then is probably what i would is another way for another word for saying your your purpose in your life what are you called here to do what is your what is your reason for being on this earth and and so a lot of the times a lot of people don't really know what their calling is <laughs> A lot of people aren't, aren't too sure what it is that they are, they are called to do, what they want to do. And in my experience, a lot of people don't really, I have to say, don't really care much about it either. Uh, I've spoken to some people, for example, a, a close friend of mine, and he would usually say to me, have you any, any books you could recommend? And then he'll straight away say, but none of those reach for the stars books. I don't, that, that's what he usually says. And so for me, hi his mission in life and, and what he's achieving and where he's going is totally different to mine and, and that's that's okay so 
you, yeah, um, you, your question was, where does your mission come in? I think that that is what your, your calling and your purpose is. And of course, then, if you can identify what that is or you know what that is, then you're, I think you're on a really, you're, on, you're in a head start anyway. You're in a good place there. And then identifying things such as principles, values, strengths, talents are going to, are going to allow you to move towards that calling in a way that is consistent with who you're meant to be. Do you know your calling? Yes. Do you mm -hmm. care to share or is that yes, personal? Uh, yeah. personal? No, no, not at all. I'll call it. Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah. So my, I know that my calling is to positively impact the world, right? Now, what I mean by that is, is that's quite a broad statement, positively impact the world. Every single day I would try to give thanks for my calling, which it more in a probably specific terms is to try and positively impact everybody that I meet. So I always try to leave people a little bit better than I found them. And my call in here is to make a difference in such a way that I remember hearing a wee saying, and I think it might have been Robin Sharma, but I could be totally wrong. And he said that everything that a man does for himself, he takes with him. Everything that a man does for others, he leaves behind. And that was a kind of a game changer for me when I heard that a few years back. I thought, yeah, that, that's, that's really it. Uh, again, some people aren't really that fussed in what they want their legacy to be. Uh, I am, and I certainly, my calling is to ensure that I have positively impacted as many people as I can while, while I am here on this earth, for as long as that may be. I'm going to push you a bit further because I know you're capable of it, but Great. How, how, do you do, how do you do an ego check? Okay. So, again, could you go a bit deeper as to what you mean? How do you do an I ego suppose, check? And, well, I've had this concept or idea floating around in my head. You know, so Some people talk about legacy and they want this and they want to leave that next one Z as long as you put my name on the building. Or do you know what I mean? It, it has to be, they kind of want recognition after. And, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things to give, to give uh, freely without expectation of reward or even recognition. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, that's almost the, the, the best legacy or the best way to give. And sometimes it, it's almost with ego. It's kind of going, yeah, I, I donated this money and look, my name's in the building or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just conscious, how do you, because we all need ego. It's always there. But how do you, how do you keep it in check that actually, it's working to my values. It's I'm not trying to self serve. I am genuinely trying to give or help or do that. I don't know if that makes more sense. I've just tied myself into a deep, deeper hole. No, it does. Yeah, I mean, listen. I think that uh, again, I'll just talk for myself. It's something that, as you say, the ego. You're you're constantly trying to keep it in check. Everybody, it's it's it is is constantly um, self talk is what it is. You know, we're always talking to ourselves, and. So you're asking how I keep it in check is that, excuse me, for me, uh, you know, I, I suppose that because I understand and, and I, through this journey that I've been, been on and I'm continuing to be on, um, I know that my motives are sincere. And so when I know that, I, I suppose I then, then that's, that's okay. We, we spoke about something and earlier and, and we're saying that, you know, maybe it was off her, but we were saying, look, some things are within our control and some things that aren't. And so there are always going to be people that, in, in certainly the line of work that I'm doing, or even hear, hear me saying things like this, you know, to serve others and to give back to the world. There are always going to be people who are going to jump and, and, and judge and have the opinion that they're doing it for self-glory. And that's okay. I can't, I can't, worry or or invest energy in in trying to influence the opinion of everybody else around me all i can do is know that at my core my motives are sincere and of course look you know in the past i'm a human being wouldn't be the first time where you've you've done something nice and you're, you're thinking i wonder if somebody see me giving that wee homeless man a cup of tea you know but again that's that's normal that's as you mentioned it's totally normal um and so I think that uh, you mentioned it there, Pete, a few minutes back. You said it's just about being, being yourself, being, being real. And, and 
Um, I, I do it by just constantly ensuring that I say, great, okay, why, why am I doing this? And, and ultimately, I'm doing it because I feel that that's my calling to, to help as many people as I can. And again, if, if at the end of my time here, people are looking back and going, well, he only done that to get his, to get his name on the, on the building. I hope that's not the case. And, and, and I don't know what building would want named after me. But um, certainly, as I, I don't know whether I've answered your question, um, but it's something that, again, helping others, it just, it just fulfills me and, and, and um, gives me that fire in the belly. Mm. Is that a thing with philosophy that there is no answer? It's a good question, actually, because I'm reading a book <laughs> at the minute. Do you know, I could probably, am I, am I allowed to plug a book here? In this? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Right. So I'm reading, this, I'm reading this book at the minute, um, which is this one here. Um, how to be a stoic, stoic oh. philosophy. I'm about halfway through it. I only got it a couple of days ago and I've been up trying to really get tore into it. And it's so funny you should mention philosophy, something that I've always had a real interest in anyway, and it just so happens that I'm reading this book at the minute. Um, and yeah, the, the great thing is even when you read that, um, the guy who's writing it, it's so funny because he'll give arguments for and against and, and really come to the conclusion that there is there a conclusion? You know, that's, that's philosophy. Mm. So um, is, is there an answer? Who knows? I was, I was even thinking back my own answer as, as you do, you know, we can't help it. When someone asks a question, you know, and someone says, well, who are, who are you? You know, and just say, well, I am. Mm-hmm. That's mm. not, well, for me, that would be, that's the answer. But again, it's just sort of going on the, on the journey, you know, but. It is. And, and, and within that as well, even asking the question, who am I? I suppose it's as well, it's about having enough awareness, I feel anyway, to, nearly know your audience right so uh, you know if, if you're at a let's say a personal development seminar and everybody's there and, and actually it's an advanced personal development seminar um if you get up and somebody asks to say who am i and you started with i am a man of integrity i am someone who serves others who tries my best to serve others every day who gives thanks even in adversity if you said that at a personal development seminar of advanced coaches or psychologists or whatever they're going to get it but if it's a the, the very first day for people that have never known this way of thinking they're absolutely going to go what is what is he what is he on about and again that's that's because people we see things through our own lens you know we we we, we don't know what we don't know and we only know what we know so if we know no different outside of that a question who am i then again, we can't. There's no judgment on on what people decide to, to for the right come to be on it. So I think it's about yeah, you're right. You know, I am is a, is a great. I don't know. It, talking about philosophy, I don't know whether you, whether there's any truth in this. It's funny. I remember my final year of university, our thesis tutor was and talking about this, and it was the question. Uh, you might have heard of it, and the question was in a, a philosophy exam paper, and the question was why. Have you heard of this? No. And, and and the apparent answer Just is which way. Yeah, 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 with a question mark. And so <laughs> the apparent answer was why not? <laughs> and so they and so our tutor he laughed about it and he said, Look, what would I give that? He said, I would have to give that a zero or a hundred. He said, like that is so yeah, philosophy and, and life is uh you know, you can go as deep as you want and, and sometimes people can begin to go too deep and get really lost in it and I think it's just about staying grounded really. That is a beautiful thing where you're you're actually paint helping letting people paint their own picture in their own heads, mm-hmm. you know. And that, I suppose with whether it's presenting or speaking or whatever, that's a lot of you know you you got to realize that everyone is going to paint the picture of what you're saying. So whether it be you know why or why not, you know suddenly everyone's going and they're applying their logic, their perceptions, their values to that, and going as you say, that's either really dumb or really stupid, really clever. It's, yeah. Yeah, well, it's like even a few, a few of the questions that you've asked me uh, about mission. And, and, and so for me, I have to, well, the reason I ask you what you mean by that is because I have to ensure that I'm understanding what you mean by mission. Because my interpretation of mission might be completely different. So I've answered my, the question totally correctly from my lens. If I hadn't clarified that, you'd have been going, that's, that's not what I take by mission. Mm-hmm. And so it's, that's communication then, of course, it's, it's something that is, is often overlooked, the importance of communication. And, and quite often I will get people to clarify what they mean, just so that, I'm sh- so that we're on the same page and making sure that we're 
or singing off the same hymn sheet. Love it. Oh, boys, I can tell you, I could get into some, <laughs> some amazing conversations. <laughs> let's do it, let's do it. <laughs> well, first of all, take us back. I mean, you know, so talk to us a wee bit about your upbringing and, and, you know, how all this came about, really. Okay, that's brilliant. I'd love to. So my upbringing, I have to say, I had a, I had a really, I had a brilliant upbringing. Uh, I was brought up by two, I have a wee sister. She's, um, she's 31 now, 32 maybe. She'll maybe want me to just say she's 31 if she's watching this. So there's my, myself and my younger sister, my mum and my dad. And I was brought up by two parents who, who loved us both dearly. And, and, you know, still love us both very dearly. But I suppose what I am, I don't mind sure either is that it was also an environment that wasn't loving in terms of my mum and dad's side. So their love for me and my sister is, is and has never been in doubt and never was. But for the first 18 years of my life, I, I think that you probably could have counted on the one hand, the amount of days that went past where they didn't share at each other and they didn't argue, and I mean viciously argue. And my mum and dad decided to separate when I was, was 18. And my sister was 15. And again, going a little bit deeper, I certainly don't mind sharing. That stems from my dad's alcoholism. So my dad is a recovering alcoholic and is hasn't drank now I have to say he's done fantastically well he hasn't I think the last drink that he might have had would probably been about 25 years ago if I'm right and trying to work at my age that would be about right what age you has, if you don't mind me asking I'm 21 Pete <laughs> <laughs> 20 I am 35 35 so um you don't look it <laughs> thanks man don't look like a day over 34 uh, but so my dad um as I say he was a he is a recovering alcoholic now I suppose I would would again want to be sure and say that my dad stopped drinking when I was very young and I only have very limited memories of seeing him drunk. Uh, I do remember going and visiting him when he was in rehab and stuff like that. And the reason why I say that is because I put a post, post up recently and it was kind of just saying, listen, your circumstances don't dictate and, and wh where you end up. And my mom seen it and my mom went, Kyle, you know, do you think people realize that that, that actually your dad, you were quite young when your dad stopped drinking. And I said, you know what, mom, they maybe do, they maybe don't. But the point is that I said, if dad hadn't have drank, chances are you might not have got separated and eventually divorced. We may well have been brought up in a home that were you, whilst you loved us dearly, and they did, I can't stress that enough, and still do, we're, we're like still the, the apple of their eye. Uh, but I said, would you have loved each other a little bit more? Um, you know, my dad very much, he, mum had to move quite a lot because dad, any house that they had, mum, uh, dad drank the money and, and so they were put out or dad would have, this is when I was quite young, four or five, so I was still, I was alive and, you know, mum would have went for maybe, some, sometimes maybe a couple of weeks on end where my dad would have said, listen, I'm, I'm going to the shop to get bread and milk. and he would have, mum would have got a phone call a week later and he was in a prison cell somewhere and she had to go and pick him up. And so, you know, you know that, that's a kind of bit of a, a bit of the background of, of kind of my, my, that sort of side of things. I always say that my mum is the most resilient woman I've ever come across in my, in my life because of what she is, she's, she's been through and, and many, many other people would have crumbled. And so also the, 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 I was brought up in quite a rough housing estate, actually quite a rough background. And um, so alongside that, telling a little bit of my story, just, you know, I kind of failed my 11 plus, which for anybody that isn't familiar with that is when you're 11 years of age and you do a test to determine really whether you're going to go to a secondary school or a grammar school. And so I failed that and I went on, done okay in my, my GCSEs. Not, not, not great, I passed most of them, but they were mostly C's. Failed my A-levels, and uh, kind of, at, at that point, around about 18, I kind of decided that I was just going to go and work part-time and chill out for a bit and live a bit of life. And my background, actually, after that was I, I decided at the age of 20, 21, that I wanted to, I was always into music, 
and I decided I wanted to make a career out of drumming. I'm not sure if I've told you this before. Um, so I set myself a 10-year goal when I was 20 to become a, a professional drummer by the age of, of 30, or at least making a full-time living out of it. And so what I'd done was it, uh, I started to do my drumming grades, got my qualifications there, and then I moved to London for a year. And I, I attended a drumming college there for a year. It was a fantastic experience. And uh, that was brilliant. And then I... That was, a big, that was a big smile there. <laughs> it, was, it was a brilliant time. I look back on it with such fondness. Uh, I, yeah. I often refer to it, Pete, uh, as well, for a few things that, that happened, which I, you don't mind if you ask about. Uh, after London, I then went to California for a while, and I spent some time out there with a drummer called Mike Johnson. And now for anybody who is familiar with the drumming world, Mike, at that stage and still is, considered to be the number one online drum educator in the world and and one of the top educators in the world not just online so i went and uh, i can tell you how that came about if you want to know too all these stories are, are yeah please do please share about. um so yeah I'll, I'll share that in a wee second so I went spent some time with him and then i came home and so i'll stop there because that's quite a lot and i know sometimes when people are listening it's easy to get lost what is everything so the, uh, the Mike, the London story, first of all, I was going to say it's quite interesting because I, before I went, I, I knew that I went over by myself and I knew that it was something I, I had to do in order to kind of level up in my drumming. Mm. And so I spent the year there. But interestingly, I had set myself a goal before I went to be drumming at my end of year graduation. And so there is Shepherd's Bush in London, which I'm sure you've heard of. It's quite an iconic venue in there. And long story short, after the year, there was 10 classes, 10 people in each class, and I got accepted. I was one of the 10 who was picked to play at the graduation. And I was like, brilliant. I, 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 I knew I was going to be one of these people. And then fear kicked in. And it crippled me, and I made every excuse under the sun not to drum at this graduation. And uh, I remember going to people and, and my tutors and people and saying, "Oh, listen, don't know if I can drum because I'm all I'm flying back and forward to Belfast, and I don't think I'll be able to make the, the make the, the practices." And they were going, "No, no, you'll be all right. Like you know, we'll get together and we'll it'll be fine." I said, "No, listen, and I'll never forget that kind of fear that what if and and it stemmed from a real." lower sense of, of not thinking that it was good enough and and long story short I ended up not drumming at my graduation talked myself out of it and I when I was telling somebody this story very recently I at the graduation I stood there in the audience watching the very band that I should have been been drumming in and uh, it was a big moment for me it taught me a lot you know when I when we think about overcoming fear and 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 looking back on what you've learned from it so that was interesting and then the, the California came about, actually, which is quite funny also because the guy, Mike, I mentioned is very much a guy who encourages having mentors and constantly, you know, he, he would say, listen, if you're the best drummer in your group, then you need to get a new group. You need to be in a group where you're the weakest drummer. It's going to stretch you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pull something out of you. And so what I actually done was, which I think he appreciated, he used to run week-long drum camps. People from all over the world flew to these drum camps from Monday to Sunday. And I booked a flight for one of his drum camps. But the only reason that I was really booking the flight was to fly to California to ask him, would he be my mentor? But I disguised it and, oh, I'm coming over to the, the, the drum camp. And there was, I think, eight or ten other people. And halfway through the drum camp, you got a private lesson with him, the second private lesson. And he said to me, what do you want to work on today? And I said, well, look, I want to tell you the real reason I came here. And I said, listen, you know, you speak about getting mentors. Would you be interested in, would you be interested in taking me on as a, a as my mentor? Would you be my mentor? And I'll, fl I'll fly back over and I'll move everything over. And I want to live with you and I want to immerse myself in, in the life of you. And he went, let me speak to my wife and I'll come back to you. And he came back the next day and he said, that's, that's good to go. And that was in the June. So I flew home two days later. I, Pete, I don't recommend this, 
I flew to California and back in five days and I was jet lagged for about a year. <laughs> you don't want to do that. But I was only I was only twenty five at the time. I didn't know any better. Twenty six. And so that was it. I flew home and packed up all my stuff, quit my job and I flew back out in the September and I lived with him until the end of December and travelled with them, got to do some amazing things, see amazing places, and basically just for three and a half, four months solid, immersed myself in learning as much as I could off him. And so why? then, why? Well, because I knew that he was going to stretch me in ways that, that nobody else could stretch me. I, I knew that, I, I actually knew that, I tell people this a lot, nobody, nobody is going to pave your path for you. Your, your own path, nobody's going to come knock on the door and say, listen, everything you've ever wanted, there it is. Doesn't happen. Now listen, um, some people are lucky enough that they're maybe, they're born in, the, in their position where it does happen or, but it's very, 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 very few and far between. Most people have to create their own path. And so I knew that the only way I was going to do, I, I knew the only way I was going to get Mike to know who I was and the type of character I was wasn't going to be through emails. I lived in Belfast. He lived the other side of the world, 12, 14 hours away on a plane. It wasn't going to be through even stuff like this. It was going to have to be the only way that I'm going to show him how real I am about my journey and how real I am about learning is by flying to the other side of the world and asking him and telling him, I've made this journey and this is why. And I made no bones about it. I told him, I am coming back here purely for you. This is not a holiday for me. And it could have been because the weather was beautiful. But uh, that's why I done it. Because I knew that you have to continually surround yourself with people who are going to draw more out of you than, than you would be able to do on your own. Mm. Or if you're surrounding yourself with people at the same level. So if I relate this to drumming specifically, uh, if, if, if you're there and you're the best drummer, the best musician, that's nice, but you need to get a different group. You need to you need to go and put yourself in another environment where actually you're now the tiniest fish in the pond because you're left with no option but to, to grow. That's why I've done it. Was there an element there of you having to prove it to yourself? Mm, I've never I've never thought of that. Um don't know what I would be would have been proven to myself. I think I'm just, I suppose I'm conscious that you, you sort of slightly, I know this is the part of the journey, but as well, but you talk about the 11 plus, you talk about the GCSEs, talk about the A-levels, mm. and then mm. you talk about the, you know, the missed opportunity with the, at the graduation. Mm -hmm. And it's almost going right, well, put yourself in and go mm. prove it mm. to do it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it could well have been, I mean, if it's something that uh, maybe uh, sat and analyzed a little bit more, it could well at a, a subconscious level be there. Um, I think think we'll probably more with what did happen there, <laughs> which was if it had happened pre me going to London, I definitely wouldn't have not been playing at my, my graduation. I would have been there with bells on. But what Mike drew out of me was this and, and helped me know that, you know what, you shouldn't really be competing against anybody other than yourself. Something that I've learned is, is that, question you can ask is, is is not am i better than him or her or are they better than me but am i a better version of myself today than i was yesterday and if you're not get the work simple and that that kind of was a when i opener for me also for anybody that that is into the drumming and the music the level of drummer that was actually coming into mike's studio these guys are world famous drummers and when, when, you're, when you have no option to jump on a drum kit and drum in front of these guys, you're talking about ego, <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> you can't have one. And so I just learned there. I was like, you know what? Fantastic experience for me. These drummers, I mean, are, they are still touring the world famous drummers. And, and I'm having to drum in front of them. And by that stage, I was like, yeah, I'm going with this. Why not? And ask me to do it, mind you. I wasn't too, uh, I wasn't too keen. <laughs>
But uh, learned a lot, fantastic experience. That took me up to I was about 26, 27 then. You need to unmute Pete, sorry. Sorry, there. I'm just curious with the fact there that you, you, you know, you put yourself in that position. That was almost a, you know, no going back. You're going in straight into the, you know, never mind this is the little diving board. You're going straight to the top in the deep end, and and you know, it's like put your big boy pants on, let's go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And was that? I mean, what what was feeling all that for you? At that time. It was what was fueling that for me was was the the my love and my passion for the instrument of of drums for the drum kit that was fueling my passion i mean i had a i i was relentless in my my practicing i was relentless in my dedication to the to the instrument and and so it's good because the actions kind of support that you know up and leaving moving to London by myself. A year on my own, made some amazing friends still, a lot of friends that are flying to California by myself to just because I love the instrument and I knew that that I was just going to continue to grow being in these environments. That's what it was. So that fueled it. It was the love for the instrument. I love to from a young age, I one of the guys I always always use as the example from a young age was I remember the Red Hot Chili Peppers and their drummer, Chad Smith, and and I always remember, don't ask me where it comes from. I know you're going, you're, you're good. You're maybe, where's that come from? I actually don't know. But for a young age, I remember thinking, like, why, why could that not be me? I actually remember thinking, hey, right, that, that's great. Like, that's, he, he's drawing for Red Hot Chili. I, I, could do, I could achieve that. Not necessarily drumming for them, of course, but achieving that, that level of success as a drummer. And, um, you know, I just always believed that that with with hard that the hard work always pays off. So to answer your question, what fueled it was my passion for the instrument and my probably what I spoke about earlier. Uh, then my goal was to to teach drums and to play drums. I essentially love to educate through the drums and in general. I, I always love to try and educate, uh, but the, the the passion was to or the what was fueling it the passion was to just become the best version that, of, of, that I could be behind the drums in order to come back and, funny enough, impart it into other people, <laughs> serve other people. Are you good? As a drummer? Mm. Yeah, I can hold my own, I can hold my own. <laughs> Such a Northern Ireland response. <laughs> Throw off a set of drumsticks. <laughs> Do you know what? I, 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 you know what my first response was? It depends what you mean by good. That was that was going to be my first response because look, again, if we want to go a little bit deeper on it, am I good? Again, it depends who you're comparing yourself to. If you want to compare yourself to what you think good is, then you know what, I'm okay. I mean, I look at other drummers and and likes of that guy that taught me. Now I see him as exceptional, and the other guys, am I on that level? Absolutely not. Am I okay with that? Hundred percent. Do I use it as a form of encouragement and inspiration? Absolutely. So it depends what you mean by good. You know, I'm good to a, a seven-year-old who's never played drums before. <laughs> no, very subtle and and uh, yeah. No, I mean it's 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 very true. You know, define defining what it is. You know, but what what do the drums do for you? In terms of. In terms of my personal growth, you mean professional growth? Just why? Why the drums? In general, well, I mean, I, I just I had this passion. My, my dad was a drummer, um, and so it was always in the family. He he he, he drummed in in uh, drummed in bands most of his life, and so I was always brought up with that and drumsticks about the house. Although I never really started drumming properly until I was about eighteen, and so I always would have messed about and but it was when I was about 18 that I found I actually really enjoyed it and um, what it has done for me is is it do you know what it has taught me it's taught me quite a lot and, and, and I actually still teach the drums the odd time and what I will do is I will use that instrument especially with with children young young adults and kids especially although adults also but I use the instrument to kind of it taught me about the importance of of the, the life um what's the word i'm trying to say the, 
the principles that you need to, to get you through life and succeed, right? And so we can elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, when we think about what it means to set a goal, so we have our end goal, which is here, and we are here, and we are trying to navigate our journey to get to that end goal. Now, of course, depending on what the goal might be, will depend on how difficult the journey is. My goal could be to walk to the side of that room now. It could be very simple, goal achieved. I'm not going to draw much out of me. If the goal is to walk to the side of that room with my eyes closed backwards from here, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. And so when I think about the instrument and, and drumming, it has allowed me to, it's taught me, and then I impart this into other people, is that when you set a goal, you're going to, you better believe that along that way, you're going to have to do stuff like this, right? You're going to have to make sacrifices, right? So with the kids, I often, I often use the, the, the turmoil between is it Fortnite or is it practice? Is it Call of Duty or is it playing your, your uh, rudiments? And, and quite often Fortnite wins out, as you can imagine, Pete. <laughs> but, um, and so the point is straight away there, the idea behind it is, look, if you want to achieve this, you're going to have to, you have to make some tough choices here to get to here. It's going to teach you patience. You need to be patient. If you're learning an instrument, you better believe you're going to have some patience, especially the older you get. So I tried to learn piano a few years ago, and uh, I just, I was too aware that I was the age I was, and I was like, oh, this is, I know what I need to do here all the time, and just don't have the patience for it. <laughs> Didn't really fancy that much, otherwise I probably would have stuck at it. But it teaches you to be patient. It teaches you about resilience. How does it teach you about resilience? Let's just say your goal is to get a grade and you do everything that you can to get that grade and you sit your exam and you get your result back and you haven't got the grade. You, you as they put it, fail. You don't pass. What are you going to do about that? You do one of two things. You can say, okay, I'm not meant to be a drummer. Never again. This is not for me. And turn your back or you can go, all right, okay. Let's assess that. What, what, what led to me not getting that result? What's that building? Resilience. I'm going to bounce back. I'm going to try again. Then when you eventually get it, what does that build? It builds confidence. It shows you that when you make these decisions here, sacrifice, when you have patience. What else does it teach you? Discipline. Self-discipline. Again, the, the whole turmoil between the fortnight or the practice, the game, the game or the instrument, you, you're going to have to make some choices there. You have to be disciplined enough to say, okay, this wins out this because I want this. And that's what it taught me. That is what the instrument taught me. And, and that is what I run a personal development academy for a few years where I was teaching the principles of personal development, such as the ones I've mentioned, through the instrument. And so alongside just learning an instrument, I was then teaching the children what this instrument is teaching you not just you can now play Billy Jean by Michael Jackson. Look at what you look at how you have grown inwardly in order to get you to be here. You had to practice, you had to be patient. Tell you what, another thing it teaches you, it teaches you that you know what? Things just don't always come like that <laughs> on the instrument. A great example is a, a a friend of mine in America sat down one day, long story short, and played this class thing, right? And I was like, whoa, it's amazing. That is class. I'm going to try and play that. And I, I honestly mean I must have tried to play it for about 30 or 40 seconds. And, and uh, I kind of threw the head up. I was like, I can't, I can't get this. And, and bear in mind, this was still during, during my journey in America. This wasn't after America. He actually said to me, he said, Kyle, do you know how long it took me to get that? He says, three months, all day, every day, I practiced that for. Now, all day could have been the free time that he had at that time or whatever, but he practiced it every day. And he said to me, you're seeing the end result. You're not seeing everything that went into me getting the end result. And so it's like that iceberg analogy that I'm sure you've seen where you see the tip of it above the water and it says success. And then it also says what people see. And then underneath it, it's everything else, and it says what people don't see. 
sacrifice, self-doubt, negative self-talk, failure, setback, um, sacrifice, things like that. And I've drawn it back to the instrument. You asked, hopefully I've answered it. You know, that's what the instrument taught me. And it's fascinating when you think about it like that because that's really what it does. There are many other things do that, of course, but in terms of even learning any instrument, if you really have an understanding that it's actually teaching you something that's going to stand by you for the rest of your life. Because if you transfer what you've learned, how you've grown through your instrument to then other aspects of your life, it's going to stand by you. So you can start to know. My hope is, is that the kids that I have imparted in, in 10 years' time when they're 18 and they're leaving school, and they're faced with a challenge. My hope is that they remember Kyle going, oh, do you know what? It's the same on the drums. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't just come overnight. And do you know what? There was many times I tried that exercise and didn't get it and didn't get it, but I persevered and I eventually got it. I've learned that if I can transfer that from this domain to this domain, it's going to be the same. So that's the, that's the, some of the lessons that the, that the drums taught me, learning that instrument. That's powerful. Uh, would you say the, the drums are a, a good method of communicating? No, I, I know we spoke about this, but what, what do you mean by communicate? How do you mean exactly? <laughs> I, I suppose for, you know, because I mean, the bass beat is, and I suppose I'm, I'm thinking long term as, you know, people say they, they, they become part of the instrument almost, you know, and they, they, they almost resonate through. And I'm thinking there, you know, about having a style. I suppose with, with drums, can you, can you put across a message? Can you put, um, you know, your own slant on it? But can you also then, you know, give people feeling and sense and everything else through the drums? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing about drumming is, is that you could go so deep into it. Firstly, you know, you can be a drummer where you are an educator first and foremost. Now, in America, there is quite a distinction between being an educator and being a performer. Uh, and so most people that I know who are educators primarily educate. And what I mean by is they educate 90% of the time and they drum in bands 10%. So they'll go out and they'll drum at the weekend. But their primary source is being an educator. Now, over here is very different. The, 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 the culture behind drumming very much is if you're, an, if you're an educator, you must be a performer. So when I come back and my, my, my love for educating, and I was still drumming quite a lot, but I, I wanted to educate more. I just got more fulfillment out of that. And to be totally honest, I got fed up dragging drum kits in and out the venues. First one there, last one out. So I realized that the teaching was the way forward. Um, and so look, the reason I'm saying that is, is that when you're an educator, you, you're... You're teaching people when it comes to drumming. There's different styles of drumming, for example. And so you're, you're hoping that as an educator, you're teaching people how to drum appropriately for the music. And then that transfers into being a performer. So you're asking about, can you put your own slant on it? Um, so you first and foremost, as a drummer, any musician, your question should always be, okay, what is required from me for this piece of music right now? So if I give you an example, if you're drumming in a jazz quartet in a jazz bar, you're not going to bring a double bass pedal and 38 cymbals with drumsticks made out of steel and start doing heavy metal drumming, right? What is appropriate for the music at that time is that you play jazz. If you're playing Billy Jean, Michael Jackson, one of the most famous drum beats in the world, it doesn't require anything other than what you hear. If you start trying to add to that and you start trying to put in fills all over the place, which is just using the rest of the drums, you're going to take away from the music. It doesn't require that. And so the first, that's the first thing as a drummer you want to ask yourself specifically is what is required for the music from me right now? Play for the music. The other thing is about your style. I find that there are a lot, there are a lot of drummers out there and you know they're drumming. Even if you had your eyes closed, you know who was drumming because they do have their own style. And so, for example, the guy Mike that I, that I went and studied with, I, I, he has a real specific style where he, because he's an educator and he solos a lot, 
and he explained to me how he builds his solos. And so I could hear a solo and go, sounds like Mike. Then there's other drummers, real famous ones, and they have their own unique style. So absolutely. Uh, now, how does that come? Sometimes it comes naturally to people. Sometimes naturally people sit behind the drums and their, their own unique take to the drums comes out. It comes from a lot of time people trying to emulate drummers that they, that they enjoy trying to they have role models and they want to sound more like this person or be like this person and that's that's great and it comes out there i mean one of the drummers that i very much in the beginning tried to really emulate was a guy called have you ever heard of the dave matthews band yeah yeah. so they're a brilliant band so the drummer i haven't listened to them in a way but the drummer the space beyond if i remember rightly is one of the hits one of their tunes yep yeah and so at dave matthews uh, they're a fantastic band and amazing a bunch of musicians but their drummer was called Carter Beaufort. And I, he plays a particular style. He plays a certain way, which for any drummers who will know, it's called open-handed. And I play that way. And so I wanted to emulate him. And, and so I actually remember, specifically I remember, I know who it was said it. I must have only been 20, 21 at the time. And the guy I drummed, I was drumming in a wedding band one night. And the guy said to me, it's very Carter Beaufort ask what you're doing. And I was like, yes, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to achieve. So yes, you can, you can absolutely apply your own style. There are different styles of music, of course, and you should be playing for the music. And one thing when you mentioned about becoming at one with the instrument, one thing always sticks with me, one of my drum tutors in drum tech in London, he said, as a drummer, your job is to be seen, but not heard. And that stuck with me. What he means is this. If someone is paying to go and see Britney Spears, as it might have been then, or Christina Aguilera, they're going to see them. Now, if people come away from that concert and all they're talking about was the drummer, you're probably not going to get another gig. Your job is to be there, make sure all eyes are on the people that are there. And so what do you do? How do you do that? play for the music if you have an opportunity to express yourself and you're allowed to do that if your musical director gives you the okay then you do it other than that people are seeing you they're not really hearing you you're at one with the music does that make sense absolutely does you know and actually i was just thinking as you as you were talking it sort of links back to almost to core principles and values Mm -hmm. you know one is that you know you are you have your style and, and that's the way you do it but your values is almost you perform what's being performed on the night. As you say, you, you don't go off on a, I can't remember which character it was in the, in the Sesame Street that went, used to go buck daft on the, oh, on the drums. Uh, oh, I can't think of any. It'll come Cookie to Monster or one of them. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll come to me. I can see him. I can see him and his wee sticks and all. But yeah. <laughs> yes. But no, it's just, uh, even in, like I say, you, you were mentioned there almost like the, the, just the, the beat and the drum and, and, you know, who you are and what it is. It's just, that's almost like the core principle. You know, that's, yeah, that's the essence of you. I and mean, then the value is the actual tune or the, the music that you're playing. So. Yeah, I like that, yeah. Um, it, was, it was curious. So I took myself off on a wee journey there. It was, it was yes. pretty amazing. So, but you're saying, so 26, you came back from the States then? 27. 27. I came back 27 and uh, learned a lot and um, great, great experience. But very quickly after being back for a year, I think it was, I, I then I was burning in mind. I turned about 28 and my remember what i said at the beginning my goal was at 20 to be making a, a living out of drumming by the time i was uh, 30 and i was doing that by the time i was 26 27 and so when i got to 28 i, I kind of started to go right i really want to be doing this the rest of my life is this something that i really would can i see myself at 60 still going and teaching we saw me and who's six in school and i was like i don't don't think i can now we saw me was a great drummer, by the way. Um, but so I have always alongside my, my passion for drumming, Pete, I have always had a passion to understand others. And so I can, I can even take you back. I remember having a conversation with someone when I was, I think, like 16. And I remember they said we were having a conversation about God. And I remember them saying, I don't believe in God. And I specifically remember then going, why? Like, that's fascinating. Tell me why you don't believe in God. What's what has led you to this 
to this point. So from 16, even probably younger, I've had this fascination to understand others. And as I got older, it was a fascination to understand even myself. And the reason I tell you that is then is uh, when I was 28, I, I decided that the thing that probably aligned closely enough with serving other people, because in, in my, my drumming career, and even as a drum teacher, my lessons did always turn into that, that kind of, this is what drums is teaching you, and this is what life's about, even at 23, 24. And uh, so I realized that, that the, 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 the discipline that lines up probably closely enough, or as I thought then, close enough with helping others understanding people understand themselves was then psychology. And then when I was 28, I went back and I started to study psychology formally. And I actually went, so another interesting goal setting story. I set myself a goal when I was 28 then. And it was a six year goal. And the six year goal was by the time I'm 34, can I have started at the bottom of the psychology ladder and worked my way up? And so I went back and I'd done a night class for one year, once, once a week, a night class which for anybody that knows was a GCSE. And then I'd done that and I passed that and actually with flying colors, which was great. And then I moved on to do a two year university access course, also in psychology. And again, loved it and, and got really good marks. And then I moved on to Queens where I'd done my bachelor's for three years, uh, studying my undergrad. And I actually, um, I came out of Queens with a first class honours as well. There was only, I think, 10% of us that done it, which was, which was a, a fantastic achievement. And the reason I say that is that the first was a goal that had kind of set myself at the beginning of my, my degree year. And, um, but I kind of was like, look, I'd love to get that. that would love, I'd love to come out with that. But listen, if I don't, I know that I'll have done my best. And so that accumulated then, that came to the, the head last year, last May, April, when I graduated. And that was the, the six year psychology goal, which I had set myself out to achieve, which was again, another fascinating journey. That's, I mean, 18 years prior and you'd sort of fallen out of school, you know, and, and education obviously wasn't that first, it appears weren't on the cards at 18. No. no. And yet you fast forward in the journey you've been and suddenly you're never mind being in the class, you you're pitching to the top. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's that's a that's an awesome I mean, is it you evolving or is it you finding what you want or having meaning or can you summarize that at all? That that sort of that snap? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a great question. And um yeah, it's great that actually you highlight that because it, it's a point that I try to to try and encourage and inspire others with is that look I'll be honest Pete when I was in primary school I really wasn't really academic and and you know what I've actually really thought about this recently over the last few months I don't know if I am naturally academically gifted I actually don't really think I am but I read and I study continuously and so I actually said this because because when I'm speaking to people, and, and again, it's a nice thing that they say, but they'll often, they'll often, even friends of mine, they'll often joke, if, say we're going to a quiz, they'll often joke and go, I want to be in Kyle's team, or, and, and like my general knowledge isn't great, like, but um, they often don't want to be in my team after it. Uh, but there's this kind of belief that, that Kyle's quite wise, and he's, and, and he's very smart, if you like. And I kind of, I actually was speaking to my mum about this a few weeks ago, just that you've brought this up, and and I said, you know, still, I, I, there's certain journals that I'll read and books that I'll read, and I'm, I'm still having to go on and sometimes Google every other word. And then it hit me that, that that's where the learning comes. That's, that's, that's where the growth comes from when you invest in yourself. And so I think it is a mixture of everything, Pete. It's definitely, I think it shows that, you know what, like I try to impart and inspire others. It's like, look at my background, you know. And again, by the time I was coming out of school at 16, I'd done my A-levels. And again, I didn't pass any of them. Now, was that due to lack of academic ability? It was probably a mixture of that and just at that stage, being a complete and utter messer like in school. By 17, 18, I, had, I was going into school and some of the stuff, the pranks that we were doing, 
was 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 well I look back I think they were hilarious so I think it was a mixture of my attitude was that's what that's probably been I had a poor attitude uh, in in as as a 17 18 as I said done well in my GCSEs but I think again I can actually look back now and I remember I studied hard for them and you, you and I probably both know people where this natural academic ability just seems to flow out of them regardless you'll hear people saying oh, I I only studied for half an hour for that exam. Nine times out of ten, I don't quite believe them. But you know, there are people who naturally will will just be able to be gifted. So I think it's a mixture of everything. I think it's a mixture of the time and effort that I put into myself to continually better myself through my reading, through my studying, which which really is it, it is every day. You know, I'm constantly in my wee backpack. Like the book I showed you today, that's one of about three that I'm reading at the minute. Try and set myself some daily goals to maybe read two chapters of each book. And, you know, sometimes you have to get up early in order to do that. And sometimes you have to set up a bit later or you make time during the day. But yeah, it is a full circle thing. And again, it's something that I try to inspire others with to say, look, here's my background. Broken family. Uh, quite quite a burn. I really want to stress that the love for that we all still have you know my mum my mum and dad actually quite they get on quite well now it's near like this love hate relationship um it's quite funny to see but um certainly my upbringing in, in terms of what was fantastic but the atmosphere in the house wasn't great uh, council estate background um you know field me 11 plus all that there didn't do well in school and really when you look at that on paper if you were to say a recovering alcoholic father, divorced family, very low income, very, very low income family. And a lot of that due to the fact that especially when we were younger, my dad would have drank a lot of the money. On, on paper, you would go, good, good luck. You know, he's really starting at the bottom there. But I kind of use that story to try and inspire others to say, look, if I can do it, you can do it. And, and don't let anybody tell you that you're not capable. You know, your circumstance is absolutely not do not define define who you are. Do you do you know why your dad drank? I have my reasons, yeah. I have my reasons. Um uh, yeah, I probably know the main reason. Um will I share it? Um do you know what? I'll maybe I'll maybe think about that. It's well I don't mind. I don't mind and, and I'll share it because I want to, but um my dad's uncle or my dad's brother, who was my uncle. Um, was murdered during the troubles here in, in Northern Ireland, and um, my dad was quite young. He was he was a teenager at that time, late teens, seventeen, eighteen, and dad will often quite attribute that, that it, at that point it was a real turning point for him, where he he, he turned to drink in order to numb the pain, but also, um, you know, he, he wasn't he'll tell you himself he probably wasn't in a great frame of mind after that happened and one thing led to another and, and ultimately when people say and my dad's great now look my dad doesn't put any drink and hasn't done he won't it's actually a great example as well of, of of discipline and and how you can turn your life around and he won't even so much as take anything that perhaps even has alcohol in a sweet peak you know that's that's kind of the level that we're dealing with here if it's a dessert and there's some sort of brandy sauce it's or a guinness sauce or whatever he, he just will avoid it completely and yet the man can still go into pubs and clubs no problem and, and will drink water or coke and which is fantastic ultimately he'll tell you himself the reason why he drank is through choice as well it was his choice to drink didn't have to turn to drink but he did um so uh of course then when it got to the stage where you know, the addiction taken over um that's a whole different topic as to whether or not it's still a choice you know you go down a completely different road there but um fundamentally it would have i would say been the 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 his his brother's murder would have triggered that well, it's not that it's excusable but you know it 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 puts a reason to it you know and we all know from values yeah. and you know i mean in, in explaining values i kind of like the analogy of people going you know god it must take years of something to build up to build a habit and it's mm -hmm. like well you know if, if you're as a, as a child and a bee stings you in the face or a wasp stings you in the face 
guarantee you're going to be afraid of wasps for a long time. You've learned quickly. You know, and that's a that's a couple of seconds. You know, just just on that, Pete, there's something actually that, that, that came to me as you were talking there. And, and have you ever read or heard of the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl? You ever heard of it? I've heard of it. I haven't read it. It's a fantastic book. I mean, it's a, it's a you know, it's a um, millions of copies sold bestseller. And Frankl was a prisoner of war in the Nazi concentration camps. And I'm not going to what the book's about, but basically what he speaks about is, and it's fantastic, and, and it goes back to what you were saying there about, not that it's excusable, but if there's a reasons there. And this quote stuck with me when I first read this and, and continues to stick with me. And again, I try to apply this every day in my own way of being. And he says this, no man should judge unless he can honestly say that he wouldn't act the exact same way if he was in the exact same position. And that was fascinating for me. Now, I think I've paraphrased that slightly, but that's the gist of it. No man can say that unless in all honesty, he can say he's not going to do the same thing. Can't really be judging. And I think that if there's one thing I've learned through studying psychology is that we like to think that we would act a certain way in a given situation. But if psychology has taught me anything, it's that we're far from rational human being, uh, the rational human beings that we like to think we are. And, you know, there's study after study, which shows regardless of how you think you're probably going to act, you, you, you'll maybe, maybe not act as consistent with, with, with how you think. So yeah, that, that stuck with me, that, that quote. And it's one that I try to, try to apply actually to, to my life every day. Well, thank you for sharing that because I know obviously it's a very it's a very personal thing, you know, and okay. it's had, had an impact, you know, but it's, as you say, it's, we never know, you never know what goes on behind closed doors, you never know different people's opinions and perceptions and the 50 things, and that's what I do love about Fair in the Belly, it's, you know, you've got to where you are today because of your factors and what's going on and, you know, choices and decisions and everything else, that's the beautiful thing, so there is no right or wrong answer, it is mm -hmm. simply, you know, your decisions and everything else that brought that along and you know vice versa there could have been decisions that that would lead you to a very different place as you say you've come from something that you know you sort of decision to, to move away from yeah just just on that i mean uh, you're talking about decisions there i remember an, an interaction with my sister like it was yesterday when i was 18 she was 15 and my it was the first time that my mum and dad had separated and i remember previously in school um, i remember the guy i know who it was and something similar had happened to his mum and dad and they separated and he came into school and he was clearly distraught he was upset and now this this is what he was doing i'm not judging this but he was punching walls and things like this this is how angry and upset he was now at that point, I even remember thinking, for Pete, he's in a bad way. And I, I remember thinking, when I punch walls, if my mum and dad woke up, that, I, I do remember this, right? I remember going, why, why is he punching walls? Like, this is, this is part of life a few years later. Um, but, but listen, everybody, I was only a kid at the time, everybody, you know, is different. And so I remember sitting my sister down and it's going back to decisions. And again, I, I don't know where this, all was, this stems from, but I was 18. And I remember sitting my sister down and I said, look, call my sister Lisa. I says, Lisa, you and I have a choice here. I said, mum and dad have broken up. And I said, and, and that's sad. But I said, ultimately, we have a choice here whether to accept this, see it as something good, and move on with our life now. Or we can choose to not accept it and use the excuse, more or less, of using that to justify our behaviors. And I said to her, I am gonna, I think it's best that we should, should recognize that this is part of life. These things happen and ultimately it's for the best. And so a few years later then, I, following on from my friend, I did find myself in that situation and my response was different. My response was, look, so the point I'm making is there was a decision again. Now, where did, at 18, where did that kind of, stem from where did that way of thinking come from to have enough wisdom if you like to take a step back and see the bigger picture and, and really put things into perspective 
I don't know. I don't know. But it was there. And I, and I remember that interaction like it was yesterday. And so we always, you know, we're always faced with choices. We're always faced with decisions. And, and that was one that at a young age, nearly half a lifetime ago now, I remember quite, quite vividly. You know, you're mentioning, you know, you sort of remember your dad drinking, you know, back to the age of four and odd, you know, so it's still, you know, you've the guts of what, 10 years there, you know, of, of conscious, sorry, your dad stopped drinking, I think it was at four or five, I think. Yeah. He, dad, dad probably would have had his last drink. Uh, it would have been, I'd have been no older than 10. So no older than 10. That would have been the last one. But I have to say, even in between that, it was still quite few and far between. The point I make about the alcoholism is that it fractured every and infiltrated every aspect of our family life. So financially, things were never good because of this this crippling illness that my dad had. And, you know, my mom was, was affected by this. So when you think about trying to get credit for houses and things like that, just not possible. Um, credit for most things was quite impossible. I don't think my dad would get credit for anything now. Um, and so whilst I only maybe witnessed it a few times, which I did, it, it was more the, the, the wider implications that it had on the relationship with my mum and dad, which then my sister and I were, were obviously in that atmosphere we were in every day. And I'm very thankful that, again, you know, the love that my mum and dad had for us and have was never in question, which was great. And, you know, my dad, it was, he never got physical or anything like that. It was, it was just, um, it, it was just what happened when he, when he got to the way he did. So yeah, it was, um, it's had an impact of course. Um, but here we are 25 years later now and, and hasn't, hasn't touched a, a drop, which is great. Do you know, I mean, you're sort of saying you almost didn't know where that had come from. I mean, in terms of having that foresight or having that wisdom to, to decide how to react to the circumstance, you know, that's, I don't know. I mean, that seems like a quite a, a controlled way of doing it. Do you, know, do you know where that sort of mindset or thought process stemmed out of? Or? Do you know, that, that's what I'm saying to you. I, I actually have thought about this quite a lot. Over the years, where I go, where you know, I'll, I'll take a step back and I'll think, right, okay, in most scenarios, you know, I've always kind of been the one if there's a, a, an interaction going on, I always seem to be the only one that was able to think the way I was thinking, right? Now, that's it's not bragging at all, that was just the way it was, I, even at a young age. I always found so, I was never really overly easily influenced either so when my friends were 14 15 and they started to go and started to drink and started to do drugs i i remember just being like okay lads cool good one great i, I don't want to do it but fill you know as, as the saying goes here Pete, fill your boots which means work away and um where does it come from i don't know perhaps I often wonder, Pete, was it something that I developed through the strength of my mum throughout the whole, how she remained strong for us throughout the whole thing and, and throughout that, that whole time, especially in the younger days when my dad's drinking would have been at its peak. I often wonder, is there an unconscious, have I unconsciously taken on a lot of her positive traits and characteristics? So as I say, resilience is just something that that the woman has at her core. And, and you know, I haven't even done the half the stories that, 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 that she has told me and the stories that she has told me, I was, I was young. I can't remember them, but the point is as, as the years went on after that, then of course there's going to be this knock on effect, this generational effect that it was having this impact. So the mindset of being able to, as you, as you put it, maybe you apply wisdom, even at a young age, I don't know. I don't know. It seems to be something that was, that was always present. Could it have been, could it have been something that was instilled at me at a young age from my mum mm. and dad? I don't know. I actually mm. don't know. It's almost like a, you know, and, and even to, to take, take your choice, put it like this, whenever there's the social influences going on around you, especially through teenage years. But it's almost, 
you know, all before your years, you're, you're sort of thinking ahead, but maybe that's because you've seen the circumstance of certain things, you know, people go, oh, it's just a drink or it's just drugs or it's just whatever. And that's teenagers will do what teenagers will do. But when you've possibly seen the, the extreme circumstance of that, maybe tense your values. I don't know. It, it could well do. Yeah. And, and hmm. you know, I think I've become okay, Pete, with not knowing. I think that's, you know, if, sometimes that's, if you, if you think where at the beginning, I mentioned about going really deep into things and, I know people who are, I mean, people would say I'm the deepest guy they know, and I know people that, that are like the bottom of the Atlantic. I'm just a wee, I'm a wee lake in, in the depth compared to these guys. And that's what I'm saying. Sometimes there are some answers, and I've, I've actually became a lot more comfortable with this the last probably six months, just through different journey and in different things. There's just some things I don't know the answer to, and, and I'm great with that. I'm cool. You know, why? I was doing a training course in London, uh, over the last, it was the end of last year into the beginning of this year. And I was flying back and forward once a month and uh, it was brilliant. And I remember asking my my tutor at the time, who's going to be my course tutor and my master's. And it was postgraduate training in, in positive psychology. And, and I remember saying to her, we were looking out the window. I remember saying, why am I so unbelievably blown away by that sky? Why, why, when I look at those clouds, am I, and even when I talk to you now, I can feel the positive emotion that it's generating in me. And I've tried to answer it. You know, I think maybe is it because I feel connected to something greater than myself, whatever that is. Is it because it, it reminds me that, you know what, the universe is, is, is absolutely massive and, and I am I'm part of it and I'm a small part of it, but I'm here. I don't know. And the point I'm making is, again, there are some things that I would have tried to really try and understand, whereas now I go, you know what, appreciation of nature and, and being outdoors, I feel connected. I feel at peace. I feel at one. Where's it come from? I'm not too sure. But if it works, I'm going to continue to do it. And I'm okay with that. And I'm are you, would you say you're, you're push-pull? Are you push or pull uh, focused? I mean, I suppose whether it be you know, you're driven, driven away from negative and toward positive or, or what way do you sit on that? Um, so I'm a push-pull in terms of, well, again. In, in terms of positive, you know, some people are striving to move forward and, and see, you know, you mentioned the sky being, you know, just having the emotions towards the sky. And then the vice versa going, well, I don't want what I had in my childhood. I want to have the best that I can so that I don't have to go back to where I was type thing. You know, whereas other people go, listen, I am who I am and and listen, let's just be open and, you know, the slate is clean from today type thing. And, you know, everything from now on is a gift. Mm -hmm. um, well, hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm understanding your question okay when I answer this. If I'm not, please stop me and, and I'll try and understand it a little bit better. I suppose I'm, I'm very much, um, I'm someone, if we, you, you mentioned positive and negative. And for a long time, when I was a bit younger, again, a little bit more immature and emotionally immature, I was all positive, 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 positive. And you can only be positive and cut out all negativity. And you know what I've realized over the last few years is that, listen, negative is as much part of life as positive. And, and for us, it's about learning how to navigate through that. It's about learning how to, get through this journey of life the best way that we can and so when you're asking about am I push pull or positive negative you know most of the time I'm, I'm very forward thinking in the sense that what I mean is I try not to get too one, one of these going into my, my, my philosophy again at the beginning so a core part of it is really accepting things that are within my control and things that aren't and, and so what I try to do is, is whilst I mentioned about being forward thinking, I also recognize that the only thing that we can ever influence is the here and now. And so I'm also very grounded in that. I'm also very grounded that the past, can't do anything about it. And the future, we can do our best to try and ensure that we are um, having the best future possible. But that is also without of our control. And, and a wee example I, I always give about this being in the here and now and 
just focusing on what is our control is this archer example trying to hit a target and you know the archer what is within his control or her control is how much practice they put in and much they dedicate time to to their craft um the lifting of the the, the bow and arrow that how much force they put into it so they could practice and practice and practice and practice and the minute they let go of that arrow it's totally without their control you know what happens if there's a gust of wind it's away what happens if the target moves it's out of their control and so it's about recognizing for me just what is within our control and what is not and so Hopefully I'm answering your question, you know, the way you're asking uh, or what, what you'd ask. But I'm also aware that, again, as, as much as there's here and now, positive is as much part of life and, and negative is as much part of life. And Jim Rohn, I'm sure you've heard of Jim Rohn. Uh, he tells a great story where he talks about, look, negative is part of life. And he says, if there's weeds in your garden, you don't neglect them because they'll take over your garden. So you acknowledge them and you rip them out. <laughs> And you make sure that the garden's all right. And, and what he's basically saying is, listen, negative is, is it's, it's there and, and we acknowledge it. And again, listen, we could go a lot deeper, Pete, believe me, I could go a lot deeper in terms of what is negative because what's negative to me might not be negative to you and vice versa. And we see other people who tend to have strong emotional reactions to things that others don't. And that's okay. Um, and, so yeah, uh, I am. Um, I think I'm a mixture of all that. I'm positive. I embrace the negative. I try very much to live in the here and now and recognize that all I can do is all I can do. And so long as I'm giving the best, then that's good enough. I think it's. I I think it's a very true answer. I Thank think you. It's probably the best way I can, you know, to 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 give it its full justice. You know, because as you say, you get people who are, you know, let's chant positive, 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 and you're like, mm, you know, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing. Tell us, you know, 20, so I'm trying to, you, you were up to 34, so you've, you've kind of gone the, the six year journey there. You, you took yourself yes. night class, college, university, yes. foundation, yes. all the way up, and, and well, obviously you, you came out on that then, and, and, uh, so it was last year, was it? Yeah, That's right. Year. Yeah, I graduated last, I think it was June, I think, something like that. And uh, big relief celebrations. Uh, do you know, uh, uh, the, it was a was big great. sigh. <laughs> oh, it was a great day. It was, it was a, and do you know what? We actually had an, an absolutely like scorching summer. I would say a summer's day. It was, it was, it was mid twenties. The, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. You couldn't have, you couldn't have asked for a better, a better graduation day and um, funny actually uh, only not long before my graduation I had actually got quite sick uh, where I uh, pr uh, a week prior to handing in my thesis so my final project of, of the, the whole degree I had severe emotional and uh, physical burnout psychological and physical burnout uh, and I was bedridden I, I want to say bad reading. I mean, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't move, physically couldn't move. So, t turning my body was an achievement. I remember one of the days having to, when I phoned the doctor and explained, I had to drive down to the the doctors, and <laughs> the doctors was it was a, a one minute car journey, and how I made it back up, down, and up was beyond me. So, I think the relief comes from knowing. When you say the big sigh, it was kind of like, you know what? I was I very much, I was trying to burn the candle there, let's say, and, and, and everything, and, and actually wasn't too aware of it, and thought I had it under control, and, and my body went, right, you need to, you need to relax. And, um, so the relief comes from the one. And listen, here's another thing about it, Pete, what I will say is this. So, um, it's not, so the first was nice. But you know what? When people say to me, "Oh, first is great," and I and and you know, that's some achievement. But you know what? <laughs> I, I worked hard for that. I was up and I was in Queen's Library every morning for five o'clock. I was the first in the library every morning. You know, so people say to me, "Oh, that that's great." You know, there's other people I know. There are actually quite a few people as well who who 
didn't really like the fact that I got it first, and that's okay. But I didn't see them in the library at five o'clock in the morning. I seen them coming in at half ten, not not five o'clock. And so, uh, you know, I worked hard for it and it taught me a lot as well. Again, I learned so much through that. It's another, it's another interview in itself. But yeah, relief, fantastic day. Family was there, and um, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You've kind of ans- uh, answered my next question, but I was going to ask: Just do you, you know, did you deserve the first? I think so. Mm-hmm. I think so, and, and I say that purely because I know the work that I put in, and you know, the people that were closest to me, they they seen it also. They that's that's what I mean. I, I was up at I was up in the library for five, very latest half five. Um, and and I stayed there, and and then on top of that, I was also trying to run a, a business, so I was maybe going in for five o'clock, and then finishing at four, half maybe half three, four, and then driving down, and then doing some work at that time with, with the students that I was teaching, maybe there at a nine, half nine, and then it was straight to bed and up again. So I think I did, and 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 to be honest, I wasn't that surprised that I got a first not in an arrogant way but when I um as I was going through my final year and everybody does this anybody that, that's went through you and he does it uh where you're kind of looking and you're keeping an eye on your score and you're going if I get if I get a 70 here and I, I can take a hit and get a 50 there I'll still come out with a high 68 right so I, actually ironically in the first two years I had maintained a really steady kind of high 2-1 which was great and um going into my final year I actually started, I nearly upped it a level, which was great. I didn't change too much, but I just seemed to take the third year really well. You got to pick your own modules and I enjoyed what I was doing. And the majority of all my courseworks and scores were actually a first and above, 70 and above. Sometimes I was maybe getting a high, like an 80. I remember getting an 80 in one. And I remember then coming through and I was kind of moving into the final term. So the last three, four months. And I remember looking at my scores and going, here, you know what, I only have a couple more modules, the thesis and the exam. If I play this right and, and kind of work hard enough, I could uh, I could come out here with a first. So, um, yeah, my, my results reflected the work that I put in. I'll say that. They, they reflected, I know how hard I worked. And as I say, the burnout, <laughs> the burnout actually hit me. It was three days before I, I had the four days before I had the hand in my thesis. And so... I had to hand in my thesis, I think, on the Thursday. And by the Saturday, pre- just previous to that, I was, I was bedridden up until maybe the Tuesday. So three, four days in bed. And so, yeah, I think I did. I think I did. And, but listen, if I, did, if, I did, if I hadn't got it, I would have. I know what I give him the best anyway. So the 2-1 would have been, would have been cool too. <laughs> what was your thesis topic? Oh, it was great. So our thesis topic was on gaming addiction and depression. And so it was, it was brilliant because quite a lot of the, the people in our year, they got their topic picked for them by their thesis supervisor. And other people were allowed to pick their topic and then present it to their supervisor. And you didn't get to pick your, you didn't get to choose your supervisor. It was all done at random and all this here. And we were just so lucky. I say we because you, we, done it, we do it in pairs. So there was two of us working in this. Um, and we probably got in the whole year probably the best supervisor you could ask for. But uh, that didn't surprise me there because good things always seem to happen to me. You know the way people talk about bad things happening to them? A lot of people said to me as well, only you. And I was like, yep, that's good. I, 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 that happens. So um, we got a fantastic supervisor who was more than happy to allow us to investigate, funny enough, Fortnite, which I spoke about. And FIFA, and then now I'm, I handed this in last April, so forgive me if I messed some of it up. I think that we looked at it was a correlation study, and we were looking at is there a correlation between gaming, addiction, depression. We also looked at other variables such as was there a gender link there, was there a link, was there a gambling link, the in-game spending that you can now do. In games, Fortnite, FIFA, you can you can trade real money for returning the game and set up accounts, I'm sure you know. And we looked at, was there a link there? 
between that and it was fascinating. Actually, our findings were quite fascinating, actually. They were great. What was the finding? Um, so the finding that we found was is that um, the addictive, me- this, was, this is what our study found. So the addictive mechanism within the game was the spending element of it. And so it, we, we deliberately chose FIFA and Fortnite because the gameplay is completely different. But in, in FIFA, you trade your real money to buy a pack. Of, it's called, right, it's, FIFA, it's Ultimate Team. And really what we, we were able to work out was, right, well, that's just like a form of gambling because if I, if I got, one of the criteria for gambling is you put down money for an unknown return. And so in FIFA, what you were doing was you were trading real money and you were getting a pack of players, but you didn't know who you were going to get, right? So you could have spent real life money and got X amount of terrible players. And so your gamble hasn't paid off. And we chose Fortnite because when you spend real life money in Fortnite, you do know what you're getting, right? So furthermore as well, in Fortnite, the, the, the things that you buy don't enhance your, uh, your gameplay, right? So what I mean by that is you don't, you don't buy a better gun, you buy a better color of gun. So it doesn't make you a better player, you just have a different color gun. You can buy a skin for your, uh, your character. It doesn't inc- it doesn't batter your 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 um, character. FIFA does. So we wanted to see was there a difference there? Okay, was there an addictive element to this? And actually, we found that the the gambling side of it, you know, it didn't matter whether you were putting down money for an unknown return or not. Didn't 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 matter. What was the addictive element was was the in game spending across both games. So it doesn't matter whether you're spending and getting an unknown or you're spending and getting a known. The, the, the gaming or the spending element was the addictive mechanism within, uh, w- within the um, aligned up with gaming addiction and depression. So, yeah, it was, uh, was fascinating. Really, really good. Did that make it sense? Does, uh, it, I explained that. Yeah. It does, yeah. And, and I was curious, you know, I was almost, you know, I'm not thinking because my mind was wondering, you know, what, whether it's the element of chance or what, you know, but it's, no. it's, it's, it's amazing the way the, the brain works and all. It was well, fascinating. Just on that, what, what really, in a nutshell, our study found was that if you want to, to get your children to stop playing the games less, stop them spending, in a nutshell, that's it. That's what our study found. That was quite a, it was a decent enough sample size and, um, you know, it was, the study was well done. So uh, that's what we found. So, so cut, the, you, cut the spending, cut the addiction in a way? Well, that was, that was the kind of link. So, you yeah. know, the, the, there's, here's what I will say is that our study found that 50% of the, the variance was down to the in-game spending. So what that means is there's still another 50% that needs investigated to find out sure. what's, what's contributing to that, that outcome there, what's contributing to that relationship. Because yeah. we only investigated, we, 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 did, we look, only looked at a few factors. So um, there's still, there's a very relevant study, Pete, because actually that, that sort of investigation is, continue now today in the gaming world in the um, game and addiction world and uh, so it was a very relevant study as well but um, I hope I've remembered that right now because that's a good that's probably a year and a half ago I was working on that but um, yeah that's that's the general gist of it so you would hope that our, through our study when you cut the, the spending you should see an, a decrease in, in game time hopefully well that's awesome that so Next step, so you're, you're saying Masters on the, on the table now? Masters on the table, which is great. I am literally just waiting on two things. I'm waiting on two wee things, funding <laughs> and um, the acceptance letter. So the, the, um, the Masters, the, the program I'm accepted on it, that's all I'm waiting for is they, they are in. They've said, look, we'll just send you an email and you just have to accept it, and, but everything's good to go. And the... The funding then, so I applied for that. I'm eligible for it. I applied for that, and, and certainly the first year will be funded anyway. I'm really excited to get to get into that. That's due to start in September. However, my fiance is also 30 weeks pregnant, and she's due at the same time. So that's going to be fun navigating navigating between those two. But listen, it's yeah. Listen, I'm 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 very I'm blessed. I'm just so thankful for these opportunities every day. You know. Absolutely. Well, it's 
Well, if the, if the will is there, that then you know the uh, the how will come. Absolutely, you're absolutely right, mate. And look uh, again, I'm I'm so lucky. I've got a great support to my mum and dad, my sister, great friends, and uh, you know what? I I am I'm excited for the challenge. I'm I'm also realistic about it as well because we also have a, a three and a half year old and um he's maybe would be i would call him my stepson actually and uh so it's going to be a fun household it's going to be fun it's going to be fun and games and and with three dogs so <laughs> it's all it's all good so i'm, I'm looking forward to it exciting times ahead absolutely yeah so this um proudest moment of your life proudest I know the answer to that's a great question. Proudest moment of my life is, is probably another deep conversation, but I'll tell you it is actually overcoming depression. And I hit rock bottom uh, at the beginning of my psychology degree. And I, I played that role of the depressed person perfectly well. And what I mean by that is I wore the mask. I wore that many masks that I didn't know who I was. And so, you know, when I look back at, at 2017, which was when I was at my lowest and, and darkest place of my life, I, it, it, I look back at it with such gratitude and, and fondness because it has absolutely shaped the man that I am now today. And so coming over that, and this is what I, you know, when you look back again, when you're asking about the first, it's like, you know what? I, <laughs> Balanced quite a lot there. I, 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 I was processing quite a lot throughout that degree, and, and certainly the first year, probably a blur to me. So, middle of 2016, I knew I wasn't great, and by the middle of 2017, I was, was very much at, at the lowest point of my life. So, the proudest moment is coming through that and uh, with, with learning and growth. I've a lot, by the way. I've a lot of, I've a lot of, you know, a lot of proud moments. I have to say, I, I represented. I, I played schoolboy international football at under eighteen level for Northern Ireland. I've played Irish league football, um, right up until I was about thirty. Uh, so I've, I've, you know, I've, I just look back at my life with such fondness and and a gratitude's the word again. It's just foundational, man. But that would probably be the proudest amongst amongst other things. Mm. That is interesting, especially I suppose uh, circling back to you know the the you know what you talked about earlier. You know, it's it's sometimes it's what you can do for yourself, and you know, and it's almost the legacy thing. It's you know what you can do for yourself or what you take with you, and sometimes preservation needs to kick in too. That actually you know, to create the greatest, tallest structure that you can be, the put on your own mask first, to fill your own cup first, to do all that. And you have to, you have to get your own house in order first. And that sometimes can be hard. Oh, man. Listen, it's so, so funny and amazing that you say that exact word of, of getting your own house in order first, because one of the biggest influences in my life over the last couple of years has been a guy called Jordan Peterson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. And um, you know what? The, the, the impact that he has had and his, his teachings and his, and his book and everything. And one of his uh, 12 rules for life is, listen, get your own house in order before you start going around criticizing the world. And I, again, look, what I always like to say, Peter, is I'm definitely not a robot. I definitely don't operate a certain way 100% of the time. It's a constant journey, constantly growing, constantly trying. Because I'm a human be being, I make mistakes. <laughs> I say things that I wish I'd, I didn't say. And, and you know, it, it's kind of, this, kind of this biblical principle um, that I sometimes go back to. Paul says in the Bible, look, why do I do the things that I don't want to do and don't do the things that I should uh, or I shouldn't. So it's kind of like, well, I've said that right. Have I said that right. Why do I do the things I don't want to do and don't do the things that I should? Um, and look, going back to that, getting your own house in order is, is another principle of mine, something, a real integral part of my philosophy. It's like, look, we see a lot of it today. We live in a fractured society, Pete. We live in a fractured world. We live in a world where you know, it's very, very difficult to have certain opinions. It's very difficult to stand for certain things. 
without facing serious consequence. Um, and quite often I, I try to take myself out of the situation and go as my own house in order first before I begin to start pointing the finger at other people and telling them how they should and shouldn't live and speak. So, you know, Jordan Peterson, those exact, those words that you use just very important to get. Do you agree with it? I do, I do. I do. And funny you mentioned Jordan Peterson because again, it's uh, maybe... Uh, you know, it could be subconscious because I think I was actually listening to one of his. He does a his twelve minutes. There's a clip on YouTube. It's a twelve minute segment where he does talk on the the rules of life and stuff like that. And again, it's mm-hmm. I like his voice. I like his his directness. And he would actually, do you know, when you say that, you know, you you know, you remind me of him as well. You know, in terms of that. But it's it, I, I I like the fact that it's not it's not glossed up. If you know what I mean? He's just mm. saying exactly what yes. it is and it's common sense and it's good, but it's, it's thought through, it's truthful, it's there, you know, and, and that's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a compliment, you know, so it's, um, well, listen, I, like, like I said before, when you said about, you know, mentioned about the drumming thing and the guy said it, you know, that, that's the first time anybody's ever said that to me. And, and, um, I know that from with yourself, it comes from a place of sincerity and I know that you, um, you mean what you're saying, so I, I really, obviously, I really appreciate that. And you know, um, yeah, I think I think uh, there are many people that don't like him, and that's okay. I think he, he can be very, very. A lot of the time, he's very misrepresented, which I think is is, is not not nice. It's not right sometimes. What what perception? Kind of perception. Yeah, I don't I don't like what perhaps what certain media outlets try to do in general to people. Mm. But thank you for that compliment. It, it, genuinely means a lot and um you know that's that will be another obviously that will stick with me the same way the other compliment did for the the drummer so i, I appreciate it pete thank you no no it's how how is self-worth for you self-worth mm. what what was the first bit did you say hi is self-worth? yeah is that what you said mm-hmm. um well self-worth look i mean for me personally are you asking how i cope with that or my take on it or my definition are you asking you can answer it whatever way you choose. Uh, for me, self worth. I think self worth comes from that positive core that I talk about. It comes from knowing who you are. It comes from stemming from your values, your principles, your strengths. Knowing what knowing what you stand for, knowing what you don't stand for, and and things like that are. Yeah, I think that they all contribute to your self worth. Maybe going back to what I said earlier about Mike, what, what, what I learned from him. Are you a better version of yourself today than you were yesterday? And if you're not, then get to work. Because uh, a lot of people put their self-worth in external validation. So they're constantly seeking other people's approval, other people's opinion, in order to, to feel welcome, to feel accepted, to feel that they are something. Listen. I say this all the time. If your validation is coming from anywhere other than within, you're, you're setting yourself up for a lifetime of suffering. You are continuously going to suffer. Um, I used to do it with, with the kids I was teaching drums with. Very easy when they're younger to see a, a drummer who's better than them or they perceive to be better than them. And I, I do it with adults too. And I say, look, if you're comparing yourself with that drummer, and that is your goal, that's okay, that's great. If you think that drummer is better than you, you can try and become as good as them, if not better. But what happens if another drummer walks in the room and he's better than both of us? And then you're gonna to have to try and be better than this person, and this person, and this person. And it's this vicious cycle. There's always somebody better than you. Always somebody who knows more. When we bring it back to ourselves, our self-worth comes from knowing who we are at our core. And again, that allows us to remain, as I said at the beginning, this ever-changing environment. We're always in ever-changing circumstances. I'll leave this room here. I'll go down the stairs and I'll be in a different environment. Maybe in the house, but I'll be in a different room. There may be a candle down there, so the smell's different. That smell may trigger something different in me. Um, but when you know who you are at your core, your self-worth's not going to be not going to be shaken in any way, shape, or form. And um, I'm now. Am I saying that I am ever impacted 
or that, that I'm not ever impacted by the words of others. No, I'm not saying that. Am I saying that if somebody wrongs me that I don't get angry? No, I'm not saying that. Um, you know, uh, and I know when to be assertive and I know this is what it boils down to and I know what to give my energy to. I'm very aware of what I'm giving my energy to, which is a big thing for me. Um, yeah, given your, I thought you were going to say something there, mate, sorry. Well, well actually, because you were talking about energy and I know, I think it was just before we were talking about flow. Yeah. I was going to ask what flow meant to you. Yeah, well, look, flow actually in, in positive psychology is a big area. So it's well studied and um, flow is that. But So what it means to me probably stems a lot from that, but also it was my opinion before I started studying that. And flow is that, that um, flow is when you're in that sense where time stands still, you know, time goes by so quickly. Like this has been fantastic. We've been on for, you know, I've been talking for a few hours, two hours, and it's not like that. Because we spoke about it, you're in flow. Flow is when you're fully immersed in what you're doing. Flow is when when you're immersed in what you're doing, but also you're getting fulfillment from it. So you hear people who love their job and they'll say, they just flies by. Flow, you know, time stands and still aligning your values with your behavior, aligning your your purpose and your passion and, and getting you into that sense of, Let's let's operate. Let's go with it. I love it. No, it's. I mean, it's true. And, and flow is is again. I think it's such a powerful, a powerful place. Really, um, guilty pleasure for you. Guilty pleasure. Probably Chinese. <laughs> Eating Chinese food. Um, guilty pleasure. Uh, let me think. There was something I said recently, and it it, it is actually that answer. And what was it I said? I can't, and I can't, I, I wish I could remember it, where I said to someone, that's, that's a kind of guilty, you know, that's a real guilty pleasure of mine. <laughs> I can't, I can't remember, I can't actually remember what it was. Um, I think, let me see, never, I, I've actually never had that question before, I'd asked directly to me, that the, the point I was making before was when I said it, I, I realised that's what it was. Um, I don't know, go ahead. Is there an, and then something that not many people know about you? Something that not many people know about me. Let me see. There's a lot of people don't know about me. <laughs> I'm probably sure. Probably sure the most of it there, actually. Um, oh, well, listen. What most people don't know, actually, is that I mentioned playing football for Northern Ireland under 18s, and I scored the winning goal against England in England. And it was the first time that we'd ever beaten England on English soil. So there's something that many people don't know. Brilliant. I love it. I yeah, love yeah, it. yeah. So, um, so tell us what in one or two words that fire in the belly, what is your fire in the belly? So my fire in the belly, see, as we spoke about it, Pete, it's been fantastic. I've really enjoyed this. And, and when I think about fire in the belly now, it encompasses so much more for me. And then just, then just lining what I'd said earlier, your, your passion and, and your calling in life. Fire in the belly, I think, as I've spoke about it now, I've had a fire in my belly throughout this. And so what does that tell me? When I, mean, when I say fire in the belly, what I mean is I've had a, a positive arousal of emotion. I can, feel, I can feel positively in my stomach. You know, I can, feel, I can feel the butterflies, which is great. It's a great sign. And... Um, Fire in the belly for me is, you know what, knowing who you are at your core. Knowing who you are at your core, knowing what you stand for, knowing what you don't stand for, knowing what you are called to do, and taking that step and, and beginning to live it, beginning to, to, to be and do, knowing who you are at your core. And so that's the being and doing element. That's the fire in the belly for me, you know, when you can honestly stand and say that you know who you are at your core, you're you're gonna you're gonna have a good feeling there. You're, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have a, that fire in the belly where where you can oh, and and you know why you know because you've taken the time, you have taken the time to investigate it. You've taken the time to actually go away and go. Why do I believe what I believe? Why do I not believe what I don't believe? 
where do I stand for that? But where do I not stand for that? And you know, when you know that, you are you you're going to be driven in such a way that there'll be no stopping you. Mm-hmm. So I think I think it's it's been brilliant, mate, because at the beginning it was a it was more a probably most people would say it. I, I don't know, you know, about having that kind of desire and passion. Whereas for me now, it encompasses the whole being, who you it's are. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So much. Yeah. So tell us, how can people reach out to you? Where can they follow you? Where can they sign up to you? Give Brilliant. us a bit, of, a bit of background. Cool. Yeah. So you can probably the, the, the best place to get me at the minute is on Instagram. I'm actually in uh, the process of working with a very close friend of ours to get a, a website and on stuff uh, sorted. So my Instagram is Kyle McD 84. And yeah, you can, you can reach out to me there. And, and, and I, I have to say, I've, I've made a point of anybody that has reached out to me, certainly through my Instagram, I'll get them back to. So that's the best platform. Uh, I'm, I'm on Facebook as well. And, and I've just Kyle McDowell, but you know, that's more a personal Facebook. People can add me if they want and if they want to get, drop me a message and that's dead on. But Instagram's the main one. And uh, yeah, pretty soon there'll be a wee, be a wee website and a platform there for people to come on and, and see what I'm about a little bit more. Love it. Uh, yeah, it's exciting times ahead for you. And, and listen, you can just tell the, the the journey you're on, the passion you have and, and everything else, you know, and it's been, honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. So thank you for your time and thank you for sharing. Well, listen, I, I do want to, I want to say to you as well, Peter, I have absolutely, I've loved it. And um, you know what you're, I said to you before as well, you're, you're really, you're great at what you do and, and uh, very easy to talk to you. It is very it's a very, you know, we, we get into the flow there, which I'm sure, I'm sure you do quite a lot. But, you know, I'd like to ask you, Pete, if you don't mind, what, what's, what's next for you? What, what, what's kind of the next six months look like for, for Pete? You know, you've been, doing, you've been doing great work with your podcast. Uh, it, it's, it's really taken off. Brilliant. Well, what, what's next? Is, do you, is there any kind of shorter or long-term goals on the horizon for you? I, I listen. I have, I have goals coming out in my years almost, you know. But uh, it's it is it's a weird thing and it's something that's set in my head now. Whether it's again, it's I think reading Think and Grow Rich and Think and Grow Rich came about from roughly around five hundred and four interviews, and that's almost a goal of something a bit like for yourself going on, you know, getting educated and going through that and saying, listen, I want to, you know, I want to go through this process. I'm the same. Whereas. I could, you know, and I, I will be sort of doing a lot of mentoring and coaching, which I already, I do some, but I, I'll be doing more of that. But also I think the getting these great conversations with people all around the world, you know, that's kind of where I want to get to. It's, it's a guilty pleasure for me. And um, I think, you know, not enough people take the time to sit back and, and think about their goals and all that. And I think the, the process itself can be incredibly cathartic and, um, well, the first time we made public, I'm trying to actually get to the point of um, doing it. That's because only so many interviews can be done that actually we can almost do like a 10 or 15 minute segment that we give people a, a script and basically shoot your own video. So you, you, you know, you sort of almost do your own fire in the belly video, you know, and, and you know what it means to you and to have a common standard so that people answer the same questions and, and you know, go from there. So. It's interesting times, but I, listen, I'm happy to go with the flow. I don't know where it's going to end up exactly, but that's cool. The universe will will do what the you know needs to be done. Brilliant, brilliant. And listen, uh, you know, it, I can imagine how much value you must get of, of speaking to so many different people from all over the world, different perspectives. We mentioned that word earlier: different mindsets, different experiences, different beliefs. So that in itself is 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 going to be invaluable so listen good luck with that and, yeah well, thank you thank you for asking uh, no i no, i do mean it made a, i said to you before as well you know you're um it's quite inspirational and and um you know you're doing great things so definitely keep it up i mean thank that. you also also sorry we just uh, we want to say no, something no no it came to me my guilty pleasure oh go on call of duty <laughs> <laughs> was, was that with the power-ups or without the power-ups i'm still i'm still at 35 i'm still i'm still playing the odd game or 100 of call of duty so that there it's just when you mentioned actually you said that's my guilty pleasure man call of duty um so uh that's it that's probably the one i would still play that the odd time on with friends anyway but no listen uh bring bring it back i just want to i want to thank you sincerely and i have i have to say i've really thoroughly enjoyed it mate so 
and thanks, you, for, and thanks for having me on. And I look forward to touching base again and we, we're going to hear more from you, no doubt. Hopefully, mate, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to connect with you again and, and um, yeah, that's only the start of it. Love it. Brilliant. Kyle, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much, Pete. Thanks, mate. Have a nice day. Cheers.